sadly, a very important topic for everyone, not just the economists, but for people concerned with how we got this developed at, uh, today and why it had such a role in modern economics. Um, we're going to be looking at it mainly from a theoretical economic point of view, but uh, we're going to look at how other people see it. So, first of all, we need to define what is the definition. The definition that we'll be using is performed by Simon Kuznets, we'll be looking at this later, and he defines it as a simultaneous growth population and GDP per capita. GDP is gross domestic product. Basically, how much stuff do you make per person? Now, this flies in the face of Thomas Malthus, who, back in the day, argued that basically there was a carrying capacity for the world, for any one particular area, and that it was impossible to have this sort of growth. That, if the population increased, and since the pie didn't get any bigger, <coughs> GDP per capita would go down. And <coughs> if GDP per capita increased, then people would have more kids, and then they'd just be more efficient, more jobs than before. It's the same thing with if we use hygiene, it's the same thing with technological advances. Basically, we're stuck in this loop, and it's never going to get better. So, so this happens. And here's an estimation of world population. It's actually not linear. The, uh, the x-axis changes. So we went from 10,000 BC, and then to the increase of five years. It's a massive explosion. So if all this were right, GDP per capita would still be He's almost right. Malthus is right up until right about here. For all of human history, GDP per capita was basically constant, and then something happened, and we shut the world. So, yes? How would one measure GDP in a way that is in balance now very, and in one that we need to do? That is very, that's a very good question. Um, these, you notice they're different estimates. Um, these are estimates based off of everything from local tax records to estimated agricultural yields by looking at crops in granaries in Mesopotamia, it's not going to be exact. But the point is, we don't see any massive spike for the vast majority of human history. And then all of a sudden, bang. Um, so part of this talk is going to be, what was that bang? Um, and we first see it actually if we zoom in. Here is looking at Western Europe um, from 1500 to 1820. Uh, and this is GDP of various nations using Britain as 100%. In Britain, that came to 20, sort of. Uh, in, uh, the, the Industrial Revolution is in full swing anyway. Um, and so GDPs are pretty much constant, and most of them stay flat, except for Holland. And it's this jump right here that is the first time in human history we have what we call economic growth. Um, England eventually catches up, and we see uh, by 1820 surpassing the rate. So, what we're going to talk about towards the end of this is. What caused this jump and why did Britain catch up? But we're going to sort of put that in the back of our minds. <clears throat> this is real GDP growth uh, today. Um, lighter colors mean not so much economic growth, darker colors mean economic growth. So this looks great. I mean, the developing world uh, is catching up faster, right? This, is, this would uh, validate all of our current economic growth models, which we'll get to later. The only problem is, this is a snapshot. You notice that other developing countries literally right next door aren't doing so well. Uh, it's very scattered. It's very inconsistent. There'll be massive growth. Angola is doing great now, but two years from now, they'll be dead in the water. It's very inconsistent. It's all over the place. And right now, um, as you see, our models just don't support it at all. Blue means negative. Blue bad. West Sahara, not doing so hot. <laughs> so, what are our questions? What happened? Um, how did we break out of monkeys and trap? Uh, why did Holland grow first? And and why did we notice that growth started before the Industrial Revolution? That's growth started in 1650. Was there some major change in 1650 that suddenly reversed the course of human history? We'll look at that. So first we're going to look at Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Dirt, and Steel. Without giving away the punchline, that's what he did. The difference was. Um, and he uses subscribe to the notion of path dependent. It's sort of like, it is your destiny, there's no going against it. Um, and exactly how, we'll see in a second. So, in a very dramatic um, setting, a uh, New Guinean came up to him and said, Why do white men have so much cargo while we New Guineans have so little? And he said, well, That deeply touched my heart. And he spent the rest of his life in that same place. It's a very touching story, and you can actually figure out what it is. Um, and his answer is this notion of path dependence. It's actually a general economic concept. It's like, Why does everyone use PCs and Macs today? It was because earlier all the software was written for them, so you get in this habit of using. That's another use of path dependence, but we'll see what it means. So, 
he looks at what things would get civilization started. He looks at how agriculture is one big thing. It's one of the critical components of, of civilization. So he looks at what crops were people using. Well, wheat, grain, and barley, sorry, wheat, barley, and rice are used in Europe and Asia. And they're very good crops. They store well. They can be improved very quickly. Uh, and they're very, very nutritious. What else is there for? Uh, there's some sorghum in Africa. Uh, that can't really be stored. It's very, um, it's, it's not very productive. Uh, taro it makes good bubble tea, but it doesn't store very well. It has virtually no protein. The, the farmers in New Guinea want to eat spiders to get enough protein in their diet. Um, and then we have corn and potatoes. Now, corn's good. Again, not very nutritious. It's also very, very hard to domesticate. It took thousands and thousands of years for them to get corn and maybe maybe food. Uh, potatoes are very nice. And it's no coincidence that we'll see that wherever there overlaps, this in the next slide, we get mass civilization. Next slide is domesticated animals. Um, he only finds that there are 12 animals that are truly easily domesticated. Um, and I was interested where they are. Uh, Eurasia has pigs, cows, chickens, sheep, goats, dogs, cats, horses, oxen, camels, and water buffaloes. What does the rest of the world have that's easily domesticated animals? Civilization down here. I mean, the, the, the Incas did okay. Africans did okay. I mean, Australia, New Guinea, that was kind of okay. North America, that's not bad. Um, this also gets into his argument about disease, because most of our diseases come from animals. Um, that so if, we, if if you're in close proximity to the animals for thousands and thousands of years, you become immune to their diseases. That's why when Europeans went over to North America, they killed everybody just from disease because there were no pigs to give them influenza. There were no dogs to give them this other disease. Um, so that's one thing he argues is a major factor. His final argument is actually something that's kind of sketchy, but actually has some merit to it. And that is he argues the, just the just distribution of land masses. Um, the biggest thing he notes is that North America, South America, Af and Africa uh, are sort of vertically distributed. What this means is that there's very little land across relative to a change in spectrum. So we can have very cold here, and then it gets hotter, 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 uh, and then it gets colder, colder, colder. There isn't really much of one particular climate zone in either of these continents. That's not the case in Europe and Asia, where the climate here is pretty much the same thing as the climate here. There's a lot more room to spread out given a particular so if there's a drought here, you don't have to change all your crops and go over here, which is what you have to do in Africa or these other continents. Uh, here, you just pack your bags and move over to Europe, or pack your bags and move over to China. And that's what happened historically. So that's his argument. Uh, it's, it does have some merit. It does try to get at the question of why did Europe and Asia take off initially. So pretty much just darn luck. Um, that's not a very satisfying answer. But it's pretty much his conclusion. Um, so it's an interesting theory, uh, but it doesn't really explain why later on Asia lags behind Europe. Uh, why are we speaking Chinese right now? Um, it doesn't explain growth past 1500 when Europe started colonizing and spreading all these animals everywhere else. I mean, they had wheat in Africa now for about 100 years, it wasn't healthy. Uh, and it doesn't explain why particular European or Asian countries do better than others, like England, Holland. So we're going to look at three authors from a theoretical standpoint, uh, one of which I hope you've seen, the other two not so much. Um, we're going to be looking at Adam Smith's notion. Um, uh, Simon Kuznets, the guy who comes up with the term economic growth, and Solo, the author of the most popular growth model today. Um, Smith doesn't 